so excited to be doing this. It's a great honor. I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to say hello, everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you today, and it's my honor to introduce these incredible panelists who are seated on stage with me. First, we have, and not in order, it's on order in here, so first we have David Cohn, better known as DK, who is the Executive Director of Opportunities Nicaragua Community Economic Development Program. Next, we're honored to have Martha Arias, Director of Latin America for Opportunity International, Canada, and we're also so excited to have members here from the Canadian team with us today. We're thrilled to learn from Martha. <laughs> Yay, Canada! <laughs> and finally, we have Brian Olarte, who is the director of Agape Opportunities Transformational Partner in Colombia. <laughs> Just an aside, I have been so fortunate to have traveled to Colombia once, and I wish to go again. I am on the board of Opportunity International Nicaragua, and I've been there twice, and I so support the work that is done in Nicaragua. And I'm Canadian, so hey, <laughs> this is awesome. Um, I also, just as an aside, want to say that I'm so grateful that everybody in Nicaragua is safe. That's uh, uh, with all the civil unrest. And I, I know DK will talk about that. Um, so let's get into the questions. We have half an hour. Mm -hmm. What are the particular challenges and needs in Latin America that set it apart from other regions? Brian, will you start with that? Sure. Well, at a macro level, um, the growth, the combined growth of the region is expected and, and has dropped considerably uh, from a 6% uh, growth in 2010 to a 1.9 growth of these GDPs in expected by 2018, by the end of 2018. So these governments are strapped for cash. Um, oil prices have gone down, and we all know that Latin America is an extraction economy. And um, when governments are strapped for cash, they look for cash everywhere in the, in the system. So the uh, hardest hit are the social programs, public spending, and of course, uh, also, the governments stop supporting uh, or uh, slow down the support for microfinance organizations in the form of um, helping uh, the organizations uh, do a better job with lower credits. So I think that um, the, what sets it apart is that I was reading, as per the World Bank, that um, the uh, expected growth of sub-Saharan Africa, developing Asia, is expected to be higher than Latin America. And I think that at a macro level, that is the main differentiator. DK. So a few things that we've noticed being down there uh, for the last eight years is just the challenges come politically. You know, when you think about the proximity to the United States, that opens up all of Latin America to certain security risks, just the challenges that come along with that. And so there's geopolitical challenges, as uh, Jenny pointed out, that we see happening in Nicaragua and a few other countries down there. And then also the challenges with uh, just the talent pool and how you see a brain drain as a result of the proximity to the largest market in the world, the United States and Canada. And so, um, you know, we think as we approach that, there are certain things that we have to look at how to challenge and take on differently. And so a big need down there is developing the leadership, making sure there's character and uh, integrity behind the people who run the country and really helping getting businesses to scale. As you've probably seen in Latin America, you've got small countries like Nicaragua with 6 million people, Costa Rica with 3 million, and then you've got countries like Mexico and Brazil and Colombia. And so the way the businesses are developed, um, it's really tricky to find a way to create a solution that can be put across the entire region. Uh, but we think that there's a lot of opportunity, opportunity to do that through improved technologies and access to uh, shared services. Yeah, in terms of uh, challenges in the region, I'm originally from Ecuador and I was just there in, in August. And I think one of the biggest challenges we're having is uh, going along with what DK says is the um, political unrest in some of our countries, uh, Nicaragua and Venezuela. Uh, being in Ecuador was just really heartbreaking seeing over a million uh, Venezuelans having to leave their country, uh, professionals uh, basically living on the streets in Ecuador and Colombia all the way to Chile. 
looking for better opportunities because even if they make money, there's no food in the, on the, in the stores to buy. There's no medicine, medicine to buy. And uh, there's people in Ecuador, for example, that are working for $2 a day just with the hope that they can um, eat some bread that day. So I think that's a huge challenge in the region, the political unrest that we're seeing across the region from Nicaragua and, and Venezuela, and even in, uh, in Honduras, we experienced some of it in, in, in uh, 2017 too. And the need, I think, in, in terms of microfinance, um, only 40% of adults in Latin America uh, own a bank account. And if we only isolate Nicaragua and Honduras, for example, only one third of adults um, own a bank account. So the role of opportunity is still huge. The need is there, and we have a big role to play to serve the unbanked, those that uh, need those financial services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What has encouraged you in your work to date? Why are you optimistic about our collective ability to address and tackle these challenges? Mm -hmm. Who wants to go first? I can go first. <laughs> our clients. <laughs> our clients. Um, I think what inspires me the most are people like Brian and DK, who day in and day out are in the hottest weather, <laughs> the rainy days, in a motorcycle going to the most remote areas. Um, putting their life at risk, like DK and our partner in Nicaragua, Sodenic. Um, I've been in contact with them consistently, and our, partner, uh, our other partner at Sodenic, uh, the executive director, Juan, I would call him, and my heart is broken because I read in the newspaper that there's, you know, 400 people have died because of the political unrest, 600 people have disappeared, thousands are injured. Uh, I talked to him, he said, my kids have not gone to school for two months because it's too unsafe for the school to be open. My son, who I have worked so hard to put him to school and university, the universities are closed. I, he has not been gone to university for seven months. And to me, sitting in Canada, say, how would I live every day, wake up, encourage that my kids are sitting at home in basically a jail without being able to leave. And Juan saying, it's okay, we'll open the offices at least until noon. Next time I call him, we're opening until two, we're excited. You know, we're opening until five, and the optimism that he shows. Mm -hmm. And I remember the last call, I just, he just said this to me, and I just wanted to, to read to you what he told me in my last call. He said, God will open doors and windows where there are none, where we're working diligently on this ministry. The optimism of the people in the field is incredible. Nothing will stop them to go and serve those people that are in the farthest places um, that we serve. So that inspires me. And of course, the clients. The clients is a huge inspiration for me. And again, talking to Juan, I said, you know, how's the health of the portfolio? How are things going? Like people aren't able to go and buy the, the, um, the groceries because the roads are closed. They're stuck also, jailed in their house because everything is, is, is too insecure. The roads are closed. There's nowhere to go. And he said, Martha, you would not believe. But since the crisis started in April, the loans that we've disbursed since April, there's zero arrears rate. And I say, how can that be possible? And he said, well, our clients know that we're there with them in the good and in the bad times. And they're so grateful that we're there with them, that they're making sure they pay their loans back because they know we're giving them an opportunity. We believe in them. So to me, that's just a testimony of, of how our clients view us as true partners, that we're there with them in the good and the bad times. And another inspiration I have is uh, people like you. When we called, um, for action to our donors in Canada and in, in the United States saying, are you willing to take the risk to send money to a country where the instability and the risk is so high? Well, you raise your hand and say, I will. Because you guys are good Samaritans that know that in order to serve the poorest, we need to take risks. And that's the reason we're there. The DNA of microfinance is to be where social and financial uncertainty is, is, is real. So, once again, the staff, the clients, and all of you are the ones that inspire me to continue working day in and day out. Right. The clients are an inspiration. You saw the video, you saw their smiles in their faces, the optimism in their faces and their smiles. So, it just reminds me of, of the thousands of clients that we have that I remember Francisco Pacho from the Sunflower community. He, um, crying because we were uh, interviewing. He said, I'm not poor. I have hope. I'm not poor. And he lives in a, in a wooden home with no running water, no sewage, no uh, real sewage, uh, waste disposals. 
and they still charge on. He was falling into arrears. I encouraged him to uh, pay up his loan. And now he's an entrepreneur. He has a construction business in the same community. He sells, the, he makes the bricks, he sells the bricks to the community, to the roof and floor program that, uh, that Mr. Cooley was talking about. So the inspiration are our clients. We're just conduits. We're just conduits. So I think I'm encouraged uh, by a lot of the same things. You know, sometimes it takes the darkest nights to have the stars shine bright. And for us in Nicaragua, we've seen time and time again what that looks like for about eight months now. And so it's been, um, you know, it's been pretty challenging. And so I would say, you know, the encouraging things to me um, is just, I think, the way God has prompted our hearts, the way that he's helped us um, find solutions to problems. You know, we had a point there in June and July where about, you know, every five blocks you'd have a roadblock, you know, thousands of roadblocks. And so... <laughs> You've got kids that can't get to school, families that can't get food, and so you're trying to think, well, how do you work through these challenges um, when they don't seem to show any, any progress towards change? And, and I think, um, you know, we just watched our leadership team continue to find a level of resiliency, and it just reminds me of, um, you know, a little bit about the Bible verses about iron on iron and how we kind of all collectively work together, donors, staff, and clients to find solutions. And so, you know, our kids are gonna graduate from the high school in December, and the amount of things that have happened has just been, you know, it's been tough. And so to see the kids and the families and the parents working together and finding ways of uh, moving our entire education platform to the cloud so that they can study from their houses and communities and taking cell phones and turning them into Wi-Fi routers so that they can access the materials. Um, I mean, even our farmers. Our farmers are, you know, having a tough time, as, as Maria pointed out, getting loans right now with, whatever, with, uh, with everything going on. And, you know, we're just now ramp ramping up sales in the United States. We've got our first two clients in the U.S. Um, last week set up distribution in Miami, and so having a lot of farmers involved for next year's crops is really important. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking, you know what, what is this going to look like to see everybody plant in the middle of this civil unrest? And we had one of the largest planting seasons we've ever had. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, you know, for me to see how they have continued to develop just allows us to really understand the power and the momentum that a holistic approach takes. And that, uh, you know, ultimately that we're going to be able to take this beyond where we are right now just by continuing to invest in our staff and the work that's going on on the ground. And so I, I think my story is very similar to Brian's and uh, others on the ground and just the sense that, um, you know, we've got the people here and that's what makes this such a magic place. And so I think uh, for me, I'm encouraged about what's to come. You all inspire me so much, but DK, I still have to say, what you've been through in Nicaragua, and I'm going to cry, um, you know, just hearing the stories of, the, of the, the challenges to the clients, the challenges to the staff, and to you, it's, it's very inspirational. And all of you do such amazing work, I need to say that right now. Uh, what is changing about the landscape in Latin America? DK, do you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, I think there's a few things that we watch that are really interesting. First of all, the velocity. The speed at which the landscape is changing is just incredible. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, if you were to look at the numbers, the investments in IT spending between 2015 and 2019 was higher in Latin America than any other region in the world. And so what we really find is that there's just an importance to look at the landscape and to really take stock of how to create really a future-proof model to fight poverty how to look at what we're doing and understand how to invest in the next generation. I really appreciated Andrew's comment earlier about you know, education being the exit and the gateway to get people out of poverty. We believe that, and if you look at a lot of the geopolitical problems there as well, um, you know, I think investing in leadership is so important. You know, we've got a school that focuses on um, an approach of getting kids ready for the most promising industries. And I think what we've learned time and time again is you can get them ready for industry, but values ethics, mm -hmm. character, these things stand out more than anything else. And so what we look at when we look at the uh, change in landscape is just trying to continue to follow where the trends are going and understand how to prepare the next generation for what's to come. 
Um, I will touch more the change in the landscape on the microfinance um, area in, in the region. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, large banks like Scotiabank from Canada or BBVA from Spain acquiring microfinance organizations in, in Peru and Mexico and having their own microfinance vehicles on the side, which uh, just shows uh, that a microfinance can be scalable but also becomes very competitive. And I think the landscape in Latin America, uh, one thing that is, uh, is falling behind, is lagging behind relative to uh, Latin America and Asia is the technology. And I think Rosa Wang from our digital financial services can tell you that that's one area that I think uh, microfinance needs to work harder on is uh, providing um, fin uh, financial uh, technology to be faster and more cost, uh, cost effective at providing these services. But one thing that I think um, it was touched yesterday was that uh, the high technology cannot come along without the high touch. And I think that's what differentiates us from others. We need to continue uh, providing um, financial literacy to our clients so they can make the right decisions, uh, the right financial decisions. So um, in general, I think in, in Latin America, the competition continues to be high, even though we're lagging behind in technology, opportunity has will continue to have the big role of educating our clients on how to make those financial decisions. Brian, anything you want to add about the landscape change? Well, we spoke about the political unrest in Latin America and how these changes really hinder and affect our uh, microfinance institutions' ability to lend. It's just wonderful to hear that, uh, that although um, our Nicaraguan uh, clients are undergoing such stress, they haven't have fallen back on their credits, but we are not able to disperse the same amount of credits and the same number of credits that we, that we were under regular conditions. Um, so political unrest in Latin America is starting to uh, look like 20, 30 years ago, and uh, I think that this, this um, affects poverty and affects our ability to, uh, to um, help in alleviating this poverty. You know, I'll add one more thing. When you look at what's happening in, in Latin America, it's, it's very heavily influenced by the United States. The culture, um, the opportunities, the market. And you know, one of the things that we've seen working with the rural poor is just the exodus of the youth. You know, you think about the back-breaking work in agriculture, and it's just not hard to understand why the next generation is not enticed by, you know, taking a plow to the field in 99 degree weather all day. Um, and so I think one of the things that we look at when we talk about the change in landscape is just the importance of helping them um, not run away from opportunity, but to be prepared when they go into a different environment. And so, you know, you look at the growth in this area, you look at the change in e-commerce and the landscape of business, and uh, really, you know, farmers in this area have to go big or go home. And I think that the next generation's noticing that problem, and so, our program is not only focused on some of these opportunities in tourism and agriculture and food production, but really helping to get the next generation higher up the value chain, getting them to a more competitive position. And I think that um, as we look out over the horizon over the next 30 years, we're gonna see new opportunities come up. I mean, even if you look at the market base for clients in the US that buy and move the market, you know, the millennium generation is gonna be bringing $30 trillion over the next 30 years into uh, philanthropic endeavors. And they're not like our generation who made their money here and will be donating their money there. They're gonna to wanna to put their money to work where they have a heart, where they see impact. And so I think uh, having these programs that tie in a market-driven approach to leverage the assets in the field, take what the staff the communities have their gifts and their talents and lift them up out of poverty is really a great model for dealing with the change in landscape. Thank you. What is one innovative program or initiative that you are most excited about right now? Brian? Well, um, again, with, uh, with uh, the Roof of Floor program, um, we have introduced uh, these biosand water filters into the uh, the, the Roof and Floor program has evolved. We have made it evolve into, uh, the, the name is now Quality of Life Improvement, which Roof and Floor falls under this. 
And then the water filters we brought in last year, we started a pilot and completed it successful. Now we have three projects going on uh, placing water filters. And these are water filters that maybe weigh 100 pounds. They're this tall, this big, they're huge, and they last 30 years. There are, the, the filter costs 120,000 pesos. This is around $40. And for $40, Plus, it comes with the training. We give them training. Our, our, the community gets training on the, on the stages of taking care of water where you get it. The first stage is uh, taking care of the water source. Then you have to let the water uh, sta uh, come down, so all the sediments, sedimentation uh, fall. And then you have to filter it through our filters. And then you have to add a little bit of uh, chlorine or uh, to uh, make it more, more hygiene. And then you have to really be careful about where you store the water, because if you store it where fertilizer or uh, insecticides were, well, you're, you're really doing a bad job. So we teach them about that. We teach them about the importance of being clean, the washing their hands correctly. By the way, October 15th is the uh, World Day of Washing Your Hands. So want you to know that. <laughs> and um, and be, aside from this training, they are given, they are, uh, given this, this water filter. In some projects, they pay into the water filter, the clients. Some projects, the donor wants them to be donated. And after the training, then we find a, um, um, a builder, and we teach them how to build these water filters. So we leave the community with the training, with the initial filters and with the ability to build more filters and uh, 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 offer them to the community. So I'm really excited about this project. We have a lot of support for it and, and I think this is innovative innovation to, uh, to our projects and to our programs in our relentless way of finding microfinance plus, which is really needed. Wonderful. This project, uh, when I hear Larry and Atul talk about how we're going to go about service in the bottom of the pyramid, a project that comes to mind that uh, it's a true inspiration to me and is a true example of innovation is a project in the Dominican Republic. They have a pilot project of what they call micro-leasing micro uh, to serve what we call in Latin America the ninis. Ni trabajan ni estudian, which in English means they do not work and they do not uh, study. Uh, and there's 40% of ninis in Latin America, and the majority of them youth and women. So our partner in the Dominican Republic uh, is taking this call to, to really reach the bottom of the pyramid. Those who don't have anything to do, you've probably been in these communities where they're just sitting there doing nothing. Uh, our partner has uh, put together a program of 12-hour training that focuses first in self-esteem, making them believe in themselves, then helping them um, learn how to manage a small business, how to manage a budget, how to manage the fi basic finances of a, of a business. And they have analyzed their database of what are the most successful basic business of our current clients. And they've come up with the idea that if they, have, they could purchase basic appliances like a blender, like a sandwich maker, like a little cart. After the training, these ninis will receive the blender, let's say, and for a six months, they will pay $30 um, dollars a month to pay back. And if the business happens to go well, well, they will end up owning that blender. But if the business doesn't go well, they will return the blender and we will give another person the opportunity. But it's a very creative way, an innovative way to give the chance to those people that have been just sitting in the neighborhood with no hope, lack of self-esteem, no, um, you know, they cannot see the light, how are they gonna feed their children tomorrow? And from this uh, basic uh, pilot, 100% of them have, um, uh, have shared with us that their income has, have increased, and 50% of them say that their actually lifestyle have improved because of the additional income. So we're really looking forward to see how we can multiply uh, products like this um, you know, in Latin America and maybe in other parts of the world. So this is a really unique, innovative program that really excites me and goes along, I think, with the 
vision that the organization has for the future to you know, target those people in the bottom of the pyramid. Awesome. As simple as a blender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I no, took that from go you. Ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's just amazing. It's amazing that with a blender, something that we keep in our kitchen as something we forget about, you can feed your family with a blender. It's just mm -hmm. amazing to me. Mm -hmm. DK, do you want to add to the innovative comments? Well, I think um, on the innovative side for us, uh, one of the things that we're really looking forward to is just um, moving into the U.S. market. So we've had uh, this process and plant that uh, many of you guys have helped to help make possible created in Nicaragua. Um, and in the midst of all the civil unrest, we passed the second round of global certifications for the plant and uh, have now got product coming um, from Nicaragua into the United States and being distributed from Miami out uh, into the market. And just, you know, really thinking a little bit about Angie's story last night and just this opportunity to build something from the ground up that can transform the lives of so many people. Um, so, you know, for me, there's two things. It's this innovation in how we approach the methodology of fighting poverty, um, really using our experiences in the last six months and the challenges we've had to help strengthen the model. And so, you know, when you have so many things happen that create difficulties, you learn where your strengths are. And so one of the things that we figured out is, you know, tourism's gonna take a little bit of a back seat right now but many of the other things that we're doing are moving full steam ahead. And so, um, you know, the big projects and things that we have going on right now that are particularly interesting to me is just the maturing of the local leadership and how these guys are going to be ta able to take what we've accomplished and just really create a flywheel of effect and send it into new areas of the country and really develop it well beyond where we are today. And so I'm excited about seeing our school go to a cloud-based platform so it can go way beyond just Diriomo in Granada. I'm excited about seeing um, the disruption in the U.S. market when brands will start being able to see how their product not only has a country of origin, but a farmer with a name. And I'm excited about seeing how our staff are going to be able to take this and really uh, allow me and the board of directors to look at this beyond Nicaragua and what has to come. And so those are a few things, uh, but really just ultimately about the innovation and, and the excitement of seeing the mo model mature. Which leads me to another question that you don't even know I'm going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one that I loved in the last panel. And you, you went there already, DK, but you probably, I hope you will add to it, but it's looking at the next year. I love that idea of let's look forward for the next year, Columbia, the work that you do. Brian, you start first, but what do you hope for, see, again, optimistic, but in that next year, what would be your goals? Um, we want to reach more clients. Uh, we want to have more impact. We want to um, have more uh, financial inclusion, financial literacy, uh, values training, and DK was talking about values. Um, corruption is very big in in Latin America, and people in the bottom of the pyramid see this, and they say, well, if they do it, why, why not us? You know, that's the only way to get ahead in this, in this system, in this society. And our values training tackle that. We talk to them about um, why you should not do this, why you should not think in the ways that you see that the leaders think so. And all, of course, it's all faith-based faith training, so I, I want to impact more people, more Colombians, more lives. Mm -hmm. Martha. Yeah, for next year, I think uh, one, um, the, the approach that we're given in Latin America is changing a little bit. We've always worked with partners that have been part of the network, and we've provided uh, funding for those partners, but I think a great initiative that Andrew started is uh, the education finance um, way of expanding, which is having a product like education finance and providing this to different uh, organizations that might not necessarily be our partners, that would allow us to reach more countries and more people by having the product and delivering to all kind of um, providers. So I look forward to the expansion that we'll have with education finance in Ecuador, in Mexico, um, in Colombia, uh, sorry, in um, Peru and Bolivia. So I think the future is uh, the expansion that we're gonna do more product-based versus just working with the specific partners. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that, DK? 
I think, I think just uh, over time uh, for the next year, we, we want to see the guys on the ground be able to run the show. And I think that that is what is being proven out uh, with this challenge that we've had in Nicaragua this year. Uh, but ultimately, I think that we've seen um, this, the, the movement towards success that we've had this year give us clarity that these giant supply chains, like in agriculture and tourism, these can be used to fight poverty in ways that we're just now starting to unlock. And so I think as Opportunity continues to work towards new financial products and services that support the poor, uh, and there's innovation put into how to create business units that work in circular economies and shared economies, uh, we're going to find new and improved ways to disrupt the marketplace and put the poor in a position where they are leveraging their assets to create a holistic, better life and not just survive, but thrive. I want to thank, I think we're six seconds early, so not bad, huh? So yeah. I say, I again want to thank these three so much. You are amazing, you so just amazing. Thank you. I don't come.